Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports collide. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This is episode number 61 of the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's show. My name is Jason Romano. As always, you can subscribe and download this podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher. Everywhere podcasts are found, you can subscribe. Just get on your tablet or your phone or your Android, Apple, whatever it is. Go to the podcast section and click that subscribe button and never miss one episode of the Sports Spectrum Podcast. It'll come right to your phone. And as always, you can get all of our content at sportspectrum.com where you can become a member partner with us subscribe it's a wonderful idea for a holiday gift $36 for an entire year gets you four magazines our quarterly magazine as well as help funding all of the content that we're putting out here at sports spectrum including this podcast including all the articles that you read on sportspectrum.com and it is tax deductible as well so definitely $36 for one year Buy it for yourself, buy it for someone else, buy two, whatever it takes. But we want to have you as a partner in the Sports Spectrum family. All right, today's guests are Minnesota Twins pitcher Kyle Gibson and Minnesota Twins gold glove second baseman Brian Dozier. Recently, I was in a conference in San Antonio, a Major League Baseball players sort of faith conference and Brian and Kyle were there and we got a chance to sit down with them and kind of go through their journey on the field and off the field and I really just love talking to both of them. Kyle was a first round pick in the 2009 draft by the Twins and Brian was also in that 2009 draft. He was an eighth round pick. Uh, Brian made his debut in 2012. Kyle made his debut in 2013. They both were on a team last year that performed the greatest turnaround in Major League Baseball history, going from 100-plus losses in 2016 to 2017, where they were in the wildcard game, the playoff game, against the New York Yankees. It was quite the turnaround. And Brian and Kyle were both a big part of that. Kyle was 6-0 in his last eight starts in 2017, and Brian tore it up. I mean, he had 42 homers in 2016. He came back with 34 home runs. In 2017, like I mentioned, he was also a gold glover and is clearly the offensive leader on this team. And it was really a treat to talk to both of them about sort of the success from the Twins' perspective and what that was like to experience such a turnaround, but really just to go deeper and ask them what faith looked like in the clubhouse. What did that look like, that dynamic of being believers and trying to be open about your faith inside the clubhouse, but obviously trying to keep a team united together? for such a long season. So we talk about that. We talk about discipleship and adversity. So it was a really awesome conversation. I hope you guys enjoy this. Here they are, Minnesota Twins pitcher Kyle Gibson and second baseman Brian Dozier. Guys, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. It is great to talk to you here. Uh, we're in San Antonio taping this at, at a conference, and it's really neat to kind of get you guys together. It's the off season, so let's look back a little bit. Let's look back at 2017 and just what a crazy season it really was. And a lot of Twins fans got got really excited, and turnaround happened. We'll start with you, Brian. How was the season? Well, it was uh, it was exciting. Uh, a lot of adjectives I could use, I guess, to describe it. Um, you know, the main thing, I guess, from last offseason going into the season was obviously with 103 losses, worst team in baseball, to be yeah. quite frank with you. And, yeah. and uh, new brass coming in with Derek Falvey, Thad Levine and stuff, and no one really knew what to expect. But us as players, we knew that we still – we had a lot of talent. And I think that offseason and getting into spring training, we kind of made it known that talent doesn't win you games in the big leagues you got to have a foundation of fundamentally sound, all this kind of stuff that we got away from. But we knew we had the talent, uh, some of the best talent, one through nine, pitching staff, everything. And uh, once we kind of bought into what we were all trying to achieve in spring training, of uh, being fundamentally sound, getting back to the basics, uh, it was – I mean, it, it was as a sprint. To, so you to, saw this we saw early that. on that this yeah. is possible, Kyle. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you could tell in spring training we just had a different feel 
you know, from, from my perspective. And, you know, Brian and I joke all the time about a starting pitcher's perspective is so different because I'm on the sideline four out of five days. and But I get a really good view at the same time of the whole picture of what's going on. And you could tell in spring training the confidence that we had. And I feel like every major sport, the team, you know, the goal is to win the championship and, you know, do great things. But uh, some of that is, you know, the team is just out there saying it. But I think in our minds, we knew that our confidence level was high because we had a lot of players coming back. And we knew that we weren't a 59-win team. You know, we lost a lot of games by one, two runs. And, you know, so a lot of those games could have gone the other way. But like Brian said, I thought one of the biggest differences was how we focused on defense and how we played defense. Um, you know, Joe Maurer could have won a gold glove. In my opinion, should have won a gold glove. And we'd have had three gold glove players uh, on a team that won 59 games the year before. And I think that makes a huge difference. And, and it's really about a lot of the little plays, just – the teams that play the best defense make the routine plays 99% of the time. Right. And I feel like we did that a lot this year. And then, you know, there toward the end, pitching staff, we kind of just started to click. And as a rotation, you always get asked about, you know, do you feed off each other? Not necessarily, but it gives the next guy confidence when he goes out and throws six, seven innings of one or two run ball. And then you see a plan that you have that's working, and then you're able to keep going through that series. So I think as a pitching staff, we got on a roll down the end as well. At the end of 2016, where is the thought process for you guys as you're getting – are you just like, man, just this can't end fast enough? or Because you had a really good year in 2016. You 40-some homers, you know, and, and, and played really well individually. But as a team, you're in there, you're like 100-plus losses. What is happening? Where is the, the sort of mindset to get you ready to make a run and eventually make the postseason? Well, I wish my wife was in this room <laughs> to answer that question about how 2016 went because I feel like after every single game, I mean, just to see – I was exhausted, so tired of losing, sure. uh, and I, losing being a good way to put it. I mean, getting embarrassed is kind of the the, the right way to put it, I guess. Yeah. And then coming home every night just for her to see the fact that – how do you weigh the fact of, okay, you're having a good season individually, but that's not really why we play. That's You don't go out to try to break records individually. You want to win championships. That's the, that's the thing. And – and to kind of weigh that, uh, last year was the biggest learning experience, or 2016, of my life as far as how to be a true leader, because uh, it's very easy to lead when things are going great. Um, and but when you dig down and you're the worst team in baseball, but you also have a little bit of a success. success that's a tough word for me to say. But, uh, when you're having that, and but also let others see you that how much winning really does mean to you. Uh, it was a big learning experience for me myself. Kyle, where's, we're going to talk about your faith journeys a little bit and some of the faith in the clubhouse and Christ and all that and staying grounded in him. But what is the lesson you can tell us from being a believer and a pitcher and handling losing? We're going to talk about adversity in a minute, but handling losing and that many games, you said embarrassing, Brian. Like, talk yeah, about that and handling I mean, that. It was. You know, I think, you know, from, and Brian will never say this, but, you know, from, from a teammate perspective, uh, I really wish Brian would have had that season 2017 so that he could really enjoy it because, you know, whether it was a post-game interview or, or really just on Brian's face, he had fun every home run he hit. But had he been able to set that record in 2017, he, he's not just saying that, that he, you know, didn't really enjoy it. I mean, every post-game interview as I'm walking by, you hear him say, hey, this is great. I hit 41 homers, but we barely have 41 wins. So, you know, this isn't that cool. And uh, – it would have been really awesome to see him experience that in 2017 and, you know, maybe 2018 is the year where he breaks it again and then we can, you know, do that. But I feel like it kind of it, – it didn't really allow him to enjoy that to the fullest. But um, nonetheless, it was still cool for us because we got to see him hit 43 homers and, and break a record. But um, Absolutely. The, the losing, I think, um, is, is tough because – uh, you know, spiritually, you want to try to stay even keel, right? You know, that's what we try to do as much as possible is, you know, don't get too high, don't get too low. And in baseball, over 162, you have to do the same thing. And um, it's tough to do that when, when you're constantly feeling like each game is a repetition of the one before. You know, like you can always feel uh, momentum of a game and, you know, whether it's giving up three runs in the first inning as a 100-loss team. You know, when you give up three or four runs early, not many times do those 100-loss teams come back and win the game. 
Now, in our case this year, when we had the confidence and the momentum going, three runs early to give up wasn't a big deal. I can't even tell you, you know, how many times you know I'm on the mound and we score 15 runs and I give up four runs in the first three innings and nobody cares because we scored 15. Well, that was kind of our identity as a team is we weren't going to let you know early runs you know keep us down and we knew that there was a nine inning game going. But when you're when you're a, a team that's losing 100 games, you know that identity. You know we'll get into identity in Christ later, but the identity of it's a team you know, really follows those losses quite a bit. We're talking about Brian Dozier and Kyle Gibson here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. And I want to just ask you guys about the experience of playing in the postseason. It was one game. It was the wild card game, the playing game, the whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it was against the New York Yankees. It's at Yankee Stadium, historic Yankee Stadium. Brian, you hit a home run. It's sort of a cool moment in the postseason to hit a home run. But just for both of you, we talked a little bit about this before the interview, Kyle, about just the experience and, and the excitement and the, the level of just uh, exuberance from the fans, from the players, just to experience even that one game. What was that like? I'm going to tell you, man, uh, for six years, my first six years or five years, never sniffed the playoffs, nothing. And you hear about it all the time from your colleagues that it's a whole different ball game. Uh, and it was, to say the least. Uh, just the fact of everything building up to, and granted it's just one game, but it really is something that makes you fall in love with the game a little bit more. Uh, because when you when you lose for so long, you kind of you kind of fade away from the fact of what you're really you know, playing to try to win and stuff. You're just losing after losing, and but it kind of rejuvenates you to um, to fall in love with the game. And um, from start to finish of the game, I mean, fifty, sixty thousand were on their on their feet and. Uh, it was really cool. I guess the the first inning kind of I don't I think you could hear a pin drop in Yankee Stadium. That we put up three no, runs in the first it's inning. Three nothing Twins before you could blink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then uh, it was. Then it wasn't. It was, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was louder than Death Valley at LSU Tiger Stadium. <laughs> and then uh, uh, that next uh, the bottom half of the inning, but uh, it, it was surreal. It really was, and it's the fact of you, you can see how you really feed off fans and and in an atmosphere like that to, um, uh, to get things going in the right direction, and they did, so hats off to them. So. I, I think you, it'd be interesting to hear from Yankees fans what they saw in their team, because I feel like they finally thought that maybe they had a team that was going to turn the corner a little bit. You know, they had all the expectations the last few years and maybe didn't live up to them, and then this year they finally did. And you could tell with Severino on the mound, they were very confident, the fans were, and obviously the team was as well, but when Doge goes deep first, at bat, it was like everybody was just kind of stunned a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then we rattle off two more runs. And then when Severino was leaving the mound, they're booing him. And it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, guy, the, the guy's that, up for the Cy Young. I mean, he's <laughs> a Cy Young guy, and they're booing him because, you know, for whatever reason. But then Green comes in, and they literally gave him a standing ovation when he got the third out of the inning. And I'm sitting there, and I will remember this forever. Like, what do these fans think is going on? Like, they just limited damage. It was bases loaded and one out when he came in. and. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could have put up a couple more. Unfortunately, we didn't, but they were down 3 nothing, and they gave a standing ovation. And it was every last out of every inning after that because they were either tied or ahead the rest of the game at the end of the inning. Yeah. But they were on their feet, ovation every third out. It was unbelievable. And they say, as players, when you taste it, and now you're like, oh, we got to get back. Get back. So yeah. now you have that itch, right? Well, and that's, a, that's, a, that's the whole learning curve we're talking mm -hmm. about, how we learn from 16 to 17, but 17 to 18 – we have so many young guys that have learned how what it takes to get to that just the one game. Yeah. Much less make a run at a world championship and just the fact. I mean, I'm texting guys the whole off season. All they're talking about is, oh man, that playoff. You know, it's the first time I've heard that play the word playoff <laughs> when being in the organization <laughs> yeah. the last six years. So. Um, so can you, you you can learn you can not only learn from the experience of losing to the Yankees, but you can actually look at it as a positive, even though you lost the game. Obviously, you always want to win. Right. But the way you guys described it, there's actually a coolness factor, if you will, of being able to play in that game and just experience that, even though you lost. Uh, absolutely. I th one, of the, one of the, you can probably touch on this from the pitching side of it, but going into the game, uh, talking with all the coaches and like kind of, quote unquote, if you will, game plan, you know, you always hear all hands on deck, everybody be ready for any time. But it really was the fact that everybody was ready and we have our closure ready to go in the second mm -hmm. inning. Like just stuff you don't do any during the season. And um, 
and it, it brought to light, especially, you know, we always talk about getting a guy over and getting a guy in from third, but like playoff situation, like we had a couple of times, I mean, we were like, okay, got to get him over. We got to, you know, this. It's just totally different ball game. It's cool to see. Be, and then seeing the team that you lose to fall one, really one run yeah, or one game true. short of being in the World Series makes you think that could have easily been us. Right. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, somebody just said it. Uh, I don't remember when it was, but there's something, and you might have said it, actually, there's something about winning the wild card game. Uh, you know, when maybe you feel like you're the team that, you know, nobody expects a lot from, you win that game, you win that first series against Cleveland. All of a sudden, that momentum is there. You know, like you're a team that wasn't expected to do it. You know, that's that's kind of how we felt a lot of the time. You know, it was almost like at the end of every month. You know, when we were still winning the division or in the playoff hunt, we had a meeting. It's like, guys, listen, nobody expects us to be here. Just play loose. You know, two weeks before the playoffs, we got a one or two game lead. Guys, just go play loose. We have nothing to lose right now. And that's kind of how you could tell the Yankees. You know, might have been playing is. You know, they expect themselves to be there, but then. Some teams, you know, as the season went on, they were expected to be in there. But, you know, media, whatever it was, was just like, yeah, they might be. But then when they were, they took full advantage of it. Brian, are, are you a fan once you're out? Are you able to watch the playoffs and watch the Yankees and Astros and watch the Astros and Dodgers and kind of be a fan and just appreciate what's happening? Or are you shutting it down like, I don't want to see anything? The, the funniest thing about that is my first five years, I don't think I watched a game hmm. just because <laughs> – July 1st, I'm counting down the days where I'm getting a deer stand. Like, we're already out of it. You know? <laughs> we're already out of the race. So yeah. I'm just like, okay, When's hunting out, season start? Yeah, well, All Star Brace set up my camera. That's really ready, good right? to know. That, yeah. That's really good to know. Yeah. I mean, but, but, it, but it is. That's how we think. And then this year, where we look up and I'm like, Jesus, it's already, it's already September? Like, okay. Yeah. And then once the playoffs hit, like, us thinking we should have been where the Yankees are, we should have beat the mm -hmm. Indians, we could, could have beat. The Astros and and then so I was uh, I watched pretty much almost every game I guess. How about you, Kyle? I feel like I might have been the opposite. I don't really know why, but I mean, I've I think I could probably total in all the playoffs if you add an inning here, inning there. I might have watched four total games wow. of, of all the playoffs, and you know, it just not that I wasn't interested. I just you know followed along on my phone. You know, had some time with the family. You know, two kids and just. I think I watched one of the game fives, maybe part of the Nationals, you know, game five against the Cubs, and then, you know, the the last game with the Astros and the Dodgers there. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It was just something. Maybe it was just, you know, tired of the, the emotional run and just wanted to get away. But I feel like I normally watch a little bit more. We're talking to Brian Dozier and Kyle Gibson of the Minnesota Twins here on the Sports Spectrum podcast, a podcast that is faith and sports. And both you guys – uh, uh, strong in your faith in Christ. And I want to talk about the clubhouse dynamic in that realm. And what does fellowship, discipleship, faith in Christ, what does that look like in the clubhouse during the season for both of you? You guys can maybe bounce off each other on that. But what, so what does that look like in the clubhouse in a grind of 162 games and trying to stay grounded in your faith? We'll start with Brian. Yeah, it's... Uh... <laughs> You know, it's one of those things, Kyle and I, uh, he'll t touch on it in a second, we kind of quote-unquote lead the baseball chapel, I guess, and have a couple of guys from each team to make sure, put it on the board, what time, where to meet, and all that kind of stuff. He kind of <laughs> takes over about halfway during the year. He's I got four out of five days off, so <laughs> yeah, he, I'm, normally I'm not pitching yeah, or playing he, that he day. He so. plays, but, uh, <laughs> but that's a different topic. But anyway, uh, <laughs> But you know, you know what? It's uh, I think one of the biggest things that I've seen, kind of how this uh, clubhouse progresses, is when you have a guy like we, Paul Molitor, who's really firm in his faith and kind of the leader of the whole organization. So I mean, the team is an icon he is, and yeah, Hall of Famer. Yeah, and when you have a guy like that that's firm in his faith, he's always at chapel, and then you see, you know, we've been trying to get people to chapel and just to uh, pray and stuff every now and then. But when you know, when you see a Hall of Famer and go in there, then those guys are like, hmm, I'm, he's doing it. Let me let me check it out too. Yeah. And, and, but uh, but you know it's always good. It's always it's always fun. And you know I'm all about trying to throughout the year, um, getting people away from you know religion and rituals and everything, and just just talking about just talking to Jesus, talking about Jesus and stuff. And, and it's funny. I think as the as the um, years or the year progresses. Uh, more and more and more people, I think, bought into that fact of how cool Jesus is, I, I like to say and stuff. And 
Uh, we got guys bringing their bats into chapel just for uh, just for giggles, I guess. I was thinking. I don't, made a joke the, I don't know. He might have been serious about it. Yeah, he might have been serious at times. A couple of guys come up. Well, wait. Now you got to share that story, Kyle. We <laughs> talked about it the other night. Yeah. The where was the first time? Where were we when Esky did San Francisco. It? San Francisco. That's when he went on the run. Yeah. yeah. Esky walks in. He's got both his bats. He's been struggling, and he walks in. Both his bats cross them right there in front of the chaplain, and the chaplain's just got like. <laughs> all right, let's pray, you know, like whatever. And he goes out and hits a homer, and then he goes just on a stretch. And it was at a perfect time, you know, side story when Sano gets hurt, and then Escobar steps in, and yeah. he goes on the run. And then, of course, he had to bring him every week to chapel. So. I mean, we needed a bat bag. <laughs> About a month later, everybody's bats in the chapel. That is awesome. Uh, but no, it's good stuff. We, had a lot, we have a lot of guys, I mean, that are firm in their faith and kind of um, – we feed off one another. You, it, Iron sharpens an iron, a man sharpens another. That's the that's the best tool as far as uh, your walk with faith, especially in what we do. Uh, spending, I have to see this guy every single day for eight months. So uh, you better be able to get along. Right? Yeah, I know, right? But uh, you know, I feed off him, and he uh, sharpens myself, and 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 that's what you have to have. And we have a lot of guys that do that. So Kyle, for you, how do you be a believer? you know, in Christ, in the workplace, because I know even for myself at the time at ESPN, that was hard to, you know, have opportunities. You guys have chapel, so you almost have an opportunity where we really didn't have that in our profession. But you have an opportunity to invite people, but you still can't, you don't want to force your faith on someone. You're certainly working for an organization and representing them. You're being paid to be a pitcher, not necessarily a pastor. But talk about that balance and trying to be a believer in the workplace. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a balance. Um, you know, I think what sometimes I've overlooked in my life is, you know, the best thing I can do is just live life and love people. And, uh, you know, I feel like there's been more times over my short career where people have, you know, maybe posed a question to me just kind of out of the blue. Hey, Gibby, what do you think about that? You know, and I'm like, well, why me? And they're like, well, I mean, you give us your perspective. And, you know, whether it's they know that maybe I'll answer with a faith aspect or what, but, um, you know, I, I think the what I've tried to do most and what Dozier said is, is you know, be available to talk with anybody that wants to talk, but, you know, more so just live life and, and uh, you know, treat people with respect and love them no matter what. And I think, you know, by all means, there is not 25 Christ followers in that locker room, you know, in a given year. Um, but you have uh, the teams that do really well, are the 25 guys that get along and love each other in spite of everybody having different beliefs. And I'm not in there just trying to evangelize different guys. All I'm trying to do is just – live the way Christ calls me to live and the Holy Spirit's going to do the rest of the work I feel like I at times will get caught up in trying to do the Holy Spirit's work and that's not my job you know the Holy Spirit's living in me and my relationship with Christ is going to look very different than somebody else's and um yeah I just I think you know that's the one thing Brian does really well you know it's not that you know you have to mention something in the post game interview every time you just you treat people with respect, you love people, and when the time comes, the Spirit's going to move and you're going to say the right thing or you're going to have the right person interview you and you're going to be able to put out your platform right there. Um, or, or when time comes that, you know, people put Christians, if you will, on this uh, over here thinking that they're always, they're, uh, everything goes well with them. If <laughs> I become a Christian, then my life's going to be great always, no troubles and everything, whereas... I mean, that's totally false. And, and even, you know, our job is not to force things down people's throat of, hey, do this, 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 you'll be saved. Come on, we got to go. But just the fact of just living as Christ wants you to live, and that's how you bear fruit. That's how you others see Christ in you and are prompted to kind of do the same and check out who this cool Jesus guy is. And, uh, I mean, he said it best. You don't, you don't go about your day just in post-game interviews talking about Jesus and everything, which would be cool, but at the same time, um, just live how, you, how he wants you to live. And um, and then when trials and tribulations do come within the game, outside of the game, with your family during the season or something, and they see how you handle that, and they don't see your life just totally blow up, but you, that you do just go on your knees and pray, and then all of a sudden everything's, whether it takes a week or a year, that everything will work itself out. I think that's the biggest tool to... Uh, getting guys to follow Jesus. In the Bible, in 1 Peter 3, 15, it says, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that's in you. Do it with gentleness and respect. It's a great Bible verse. I love that. So I want to sort of bring it into your guys' world and have you share a story or two, something that comes to your mind, 
from either of you, I'll just leave it open-ended and either of you can speak up, of when you've been able to do that. When you might not force your faith down anybody's throat, but somebody comes to you and says, Kyle, what, why are you different? Tell me about what you have. Or Brian, there's something going on here with this faith thing that's been tugging at me. An opportunity to share maybe your faith, but being prepared to give a reason for the hope that's in you, not forcing it down their throats. Is there a moment that comes to mind, maybe a teammate, even an opportunity over in minor leagues, major leagues that comes to mind? Uh, if you got something right now, but you know, one, th- one of the biggest things in my life, it didn't even, it happened when I was played college baseball and uh, we're talking about teammates. So I guess, you know, not really at the big league level, but it uh, still counts. <laughs> yeah. But, I, it, uh, but it, it changed my life forever. Um, my, um, two of my great friends are twin brothers and they uh, were atheists on my Southern Miss baseball team. For my first two or three years, Every time we talked, they were, they were very intelligent. They knew a lot about uh, a lot of different things outside the Bible. If you ever talk to uh, non-believers and atheists, they you know about theology and stuff outside. And I wasn't very up to date with that kind of stuff, I guess, so to speak. I'm not that smart of a guy, I don't think. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I wanted to dig deeper into that. And every time we talked, and they would come to me, hey, what do you think about this? And I wasn't really prepared. And... Every time that I wanted to talk to them and try to, if you will, persuade them to become a Christian, it was always quoting scripture and rules and regulations and uh, so many different things. And not once did I ever mis- mention Jesus, <laughs> like the only thing that matters. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, because I grew up kind of just a side bit of how I got to know Jesus. I, I gave my life to Christ, grew up in a you know, the typical story, grew up in the church baptized when I was 12 years old, gave my life to Christ at 12, and uh, was a Christian, I, but I, as I like to say, a different kind of Christian, kind of in love with the idea of Christ rather than in love with Christ. And it wasn't until that time where I felt like, okay, I'm just, I'm just a guy that can know Scripture and, and kind of knows how my church does and, and yeah. know when to give and when to, like, Rather than, I never even mentioned Jesus to him. And when I started talking about Jesus and Jesus, and that's just saying the name over and over to them, rather than them thinking, well, Christians are, are, are corrupt by rituals and religion and all this kind of stuff, when I started doing that, you could start to see the Holy Spirit working inside of them. And they started wanting to know more about this, like I keep saying, this cool Jesus guy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a total... That changed my life forever, and that changed my walk with faith. That changed uh, my wife's. She started. She grew up Catholic, the same exact kind of situation, and she just wants to give her life to Jesus. And these guys started to want to do that. And it's, I don't know where they are with their walk with faith now, but I know that at that time we were put together to talk about Jesus and hmm. have their life change. And it was it was almost unbelievable. It's an awesome story, Kyle. Yeah, I man, I a similar story, but actually. One that is most recent happened this year, and uh, it was really cool because, um, you know, just a guy that I've known for a really long time, and he's been in the system a long time, and just kind of out of the blue, I don't even know how we got on the topic, but it might have been, you know, I showed up around the time he was sitting in his locker, and it was probably 2.30 on a Tuesday after a Bible study, and he was kind of like, you know, whenever you show up at 2.30 and you're, you know, not like the starting pitcher people wonder hey why are you showing up so late right yeah. <laughs> so so i get in there and he's just like man what where were you i was like oh just a bible study and you know we on the he didn't really say much after that but then you know we were on the on the bench that day and we started talking about it and like hey what you talking about well, talking about the difference between religion and and you know a relationship with christ and and following christ and he just started he had never been to chapel the entire time i've known him and been his teammate um, which doesn't necessarily mean anything, you know, as I found out, like he grew up Catholic and, and grew up in a home that really, they went to church. Um, but, you know, kind of what Brian was saying, he was so used to the rules and regulations that he just kind of got turned off to it and really just, you know, didn't practice much. And before you know it, like, <laughs> I'm sitting here talking to this guy and, and we start talking about Jesus and my relationship and how I look at it and, you know, how it really changed my walk when I read the book, Speaking of Jesus by Carl Maderis. And he's like, hey, next time you guys have the Bible study, just, you know, come get me. And, or next time chapel, I was like, 
all right, you know, just thinking, you know, some guys always say like, hey, you know, let me know next time we're going to chapel. Yeah. So I told him, you know, that next Sunday when we were had chapel, and um, I think he had something you know going on at the time, but, and then Tuesday that next Tuesday came along at home is when we do our Bible studies, and you know, I told him, hey, you know, this is the notes from what we did. He's like, why didn't you come get me? And I just like I just failed to you know actually engage in the conversation that happened. But then before you know it, the guy doesn't miss a chapel the last you know two months of the season, month and a half of the season, and. You know, he starts opening up and, and talking more to me about, you know, I like this kind of relationship idea. I don't like the religion side of it, but I like this relationship side of it. And and uh, it's just cool cool stuff like that that we always have a, a chance to, when the door opens, yeah, that's kind of my goal is when the door opens, I don't want to miss it. And I feel like I've missed a lot in my career, but, you know, that was one where it was just really cool to get the chance to, to talk about that. So you got to, you got to capitalize on that. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, we're talking to Brian Dozier and Kyle Gibson here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast from the Minnesota Twins. Now, as we wrap up, I want to kind of hit on a couple themes with you guys. We talked about this beforehand. I think it's important uh, to just discuss a few things. Number one being adversity. And Kyle, we'll start with you and just what that looks like. Also, it's something that all athletes deal with, right? And you're able to bounce back from adversity. That's a big thing. You go 0 for 12 and then you come back and go 3 for 4 and you're sort of bouncing back. Or you have a couple bad outings and you come back. But what does that look like for you guys as a professional athlete, Kyle, as a professional athlete who loves Christ and what that is in terms of overcoming adversity? And you had to do a little bit of that this year. Yeah, so this was going to be the other story that I was you know, thinking about sharing right then because... Um you know, with how the first part of the year went, I got sent down for the first time in four seasons and, you know, really just was struggling at the field to even just be myself. And I thought that I was doing a great job of putting up a show. And, but I just can't tell you how many people came up to me and Molly being one of them, like, Gibby, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. What's up? He's like, you just don't look like yourself. Hmm. Like, I can tell that it's weighing on you. And, uh, you know, being sent down was tough, uh, you know, but it gave me a chance to work on some things. And, you know, feel like I was getting away from the feeling of letting my teammates down every five days because that can really weigh on you when the rest of your team's playing well and you feel like the guy that's not. Um, but coming toward the end of the season, I get get called back up in the middle of the year. Um, and really, when I was in the minor leagues, I had just a chance to, like, just breathe a little bit and start to enjoy the game a little bit. And I came across the, the Romans passages. I was going through Romans there in, uh, I want to say it was the beginning of, beginning or middle of August. And uh, it's Romans 5, 3 through 5, very popular scripture. You know, sufferings bring perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And I'm sitting here looking at this. I'm like, all right, I get the first three. You know, that makes a lot of sense. But then why does why should I feel hope after going through all this stuff? Hmm. And uh, so I hadn't really done this a whole lot, and I really want to do it more. But I just took the word hope, and I just dug into it a little bit. Okay, what is hope exactly? Um, because hope, you know, to me was like, okay, I should feel really good about this. I should, you know make me believe more and like get closer to God. Well, one of the definitions or synonym of, of hope is trust. And um, I feel like when I plug the word in trust, uh, for me, you know, in you know, the baseball side, you know, I go through sufferings, you know, as a pitcher, I persevere through it. And I get sent down and I start working on things, which helps my character. And then what I get at the end of it is I have more of a trust in my stuff. And that's ultimately what turned my season around is figuring out trusting my fastball and trusting my actual stuff. And it's kind of the same thing, you know, when it, the story that I was going to share is I got the chance to talk to our sports psychologist and really dig deep on how my identity away from the field was great, not sold, like not solid on baseball at all, but my identity on the field was being very much determined by my failures instead of my identity in Christ. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't allowing my identity in Christ to fully encompass all of it. So it gave me the chance to, I ended up doing quite a bit of interviews, you know, talking about the, the talk I had with Dr. Aberman and really just shifting my mindset. What do I want to do and what do I need to do? Because every pitch I was saying, okay, I need to get a ground ball here. I need to do this, need to do that. Well, when we fail at things in life that we need to do, that's how our identity is driven. Hmm. You know, if you just look at this podcast, if you have a deadline and you tell yourself, man, I really need to get this podcast done tonight. All right, you're going to sacrifice time with your kids to get this podcast done. Because if you don't get it done, you missed a deadline, and now you, what you do is thrown off. If you tell yourself, I really want to get this podcast done, you're making the decision to get it done. So if you go play with your kids and you don't get it done until tomorrow, you don't really care. Yeah. So what I had to do was shift the way I looked at baseball, and I wanted to do it. And when you want to do it, you have the power over it to do it or not do it. Um, and I, I got the chance to share that more in interviews and 
really kind of dive into not just on the baseball side, but saying, hey, this is faith. This is where my faith comes in, and I realize that I'm able to do it and I want to do it because Christ gave me the chance to do it. And whether I fail or succeed, I wanted to do it, and it's not going to drive my identity anymore. And you did it. I mean, you won six out of your – you were 6-0 and in your last eight starts and pitched very well down the stretch. So, obviously, that, that started working for you. Brian, what about you in adversity? You're playing every day as a hitter, yeah. and you are going to have good days and bad days and just bouncing back from adversity. You talked about even bouncing back from the 103-loss season or 105-loss season and coming back the next year. What does that mean to you, adversity, and trying to overcome that? Well, the first thing to recognize, and this is not just as a – MLB players that we all go through adversity and I can I can look back at the uh, the adversity I've been through through my life that if those things would not have happened I would not be the person the man the player the husband that I am uh, and I and, and it's just so crazy that uh, you know just looking back at the things you know as we're talking right now that Christ puts those things in your lives to to to, to make you better people, to make mm. you a better follower. To uh, And I tell people all the time that it all starts with a, a foundation. And if you have the foundation in Christ and you know um, not what you're playing for, but who you're playing for, and, and everything else seems to be a breeze, in, in my opinion. And you're going to go through ups and downs. Christ wants us, uh, John Gordon was talking about it earlier, Christ wants us to be competitive, wants us to be successful. And, uh, but also humble yourself before the Lord. And, and uh, when you have that so- solid foundation and when you go through adverse times, uh, whether it be a 0 for 20, 30 slump, which I've been there. <laughs> I mean, Doesn't I, sound I, I fun. I don't want to see anybody at the time. I just want to crawl in the <laughs> hole in the dugout somewhere. But, uh, yeah. but when, you, when you do go through that, uh, like John was talking about earlier today um, when he was speaking, the fact of just remind yourself of, Get, get back to loving what you do and get back to, I still love playing baseball. I love playing for Jesus to glorify him, like it says 1 Corinthians 10, 31. And all you do, whether it's what you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do in life, do it all to glorify him. Right. And if I'm trying to glorify myself or my, my family or uh, try to make a lot of money or drive a nice car or build the biggest house in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, then that, you're, you're, you're all out of whack. I mean, you really are, and uh, which I do like a lot of hunting land, but that's a different. <laughs> that's a different. You could thing. be neighbors with Brett Favre. Yeah, right. right? So, uh, <laughs> but all in all, I think the, the the biggest thing is telling yourself over and over that um, who you play for, why you're on the field, why you step into the batter's box every day. Mm. And when you have that mindset, um, things that, that when adverse times comes, it seems to be a little easier to get through. So I want to I want to ask you about what I think is probably your most recent struggle time because 2017 I feel like was a year where you're pretty consistent for most of your you had your slumps but 2016 even though it was a record year what people probably forget because you ended up with 40 plus homers is you killed spring training just like all of the Minnesota Twins right and we had a lot of confidence coming out of 2016 because we won the most games in Florida I believe in spring training and we hit like 320 something as a team and you were one of those guys so then a month and a half into the season you still have an option left right right right? And there's now talk of a guy who's signed a four-year deal who's hitting 170 with two homers through the first month and a half of the season yeah. of being sent down right. and going through that type of adversity. What, like, what's going through your mind there? And then the turnaround that happens where you, the last three and a half months of the season, you're on Barry Bonds' pace of hitting homers. Because well, you really were. Like, he's not going to say that, but the last two months, you were literally on 75 homer pace. Hmm. You know, we, we talk about... Iron sharpens an iron, man sharpens another. Um, in this game, anytime you have words of encouragement, whether it be out of second base or in the locker room or at a restaurant, uh, especially when you're going through a downtime, um, it seems that even those little words can pick you up so high. And just to somebody to tell you, hey, you're pretty good, man. Like, you know, <laughs> Dustin Perjoria told me at second base, we played him early on, and he told me, uh, one of the best things ever, and it's the fact of he always hated. I remember listening to quotes and interviews and everything about how he's if he was struggling for a few weeks, you know, he'd always say, "Talk to me in September. If it's not there, then we can talk about it." Because mm-hmm. baseball is such a game where 
hey, we, we like to critique numbers day in and day out, whereas it's not a game you can do that. You can't <laughs> because you have so many ups and downs. Guys on the mound are so good that you run into a like we call it a buzz saw for a few days. And, yeah. And then it it's gets the totality. You right. Yeah, you just and then, but at the same time, if you can have the mindset that hey, in September, everything's gonna be kind of be there. I guess it kind of has been. I guess for my career, just don't let a month, a, a bad month, kind of dictate what you've been trying to accomplish and everything. And and uh, when he told me those words, hey, listen, that's what I always like to tell him. Talk to me in September. We play y'all again in September. Hmm. If you're still in 190 then we'll have another talk. And then I was like, okay, this is like one of the best second basements ever to play the game. He's telling me this. Like, all right, cool. I'm just going to just like not really care what it says up on the scoreboard. Still try to play the game to win the game, and then stats will come and all that kind of stuff. But at the time, uh, it was it was, um, it was was a check in my um, leadership uh how I am in a person of going through adversity and um, remaining optim- optimistic throughout times like that and getting those encouraging words from a future Hall of Famer is pretty cool. What about the last thing we'll talk about here, uh, platform, and understanding that God has given you guys both a huge platform as professional baseball players, major league baseball players, not professional, but major league baseball players, and then having success and doing so well and winning gold gloves and hitting 40 homers and winning 12 games and being a starting pitcher. How important is it to use your platform that God has placed before you to be open about your faith, to share your faith? How important is that, Kyle? We'll start with you. Uh, yeah, it's very important. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think as we've talked a little bit, you know, you want to not that you want to be careful because there's there's a point where you don't want to tiptoe around the gospel you know whatsoever and there's a time when you need to be very blunt with people and there's a time where like we've talked about you just live your life and you know i think you know we all pick our times i know brian does a ton of charity work and and you know i'm sure he does most of that charity work with the with the statement being made guys i am here because god has put me here and that's why i'm doing this work and um you know i'm we're both blessed to have wives who are you know, very much so in wanting to do charity work. And I think that's not the only way to use your platform, but I feel like that's been uh, more of an intimate uh, situation where I can invite, you know, 15 to 20 kids, and whether it's college kid group or high school group, and they come to the field once a homestand. And you really get a chance to then get in a smaller setting and, and really share your faith. And uh, you know, I, there were times when I was struggling this year where I really had to, check myself a little bit because once again I had kind of lost my identity on the field and I just had to remind myself listen whether I have a five year or a six year if I'm able to do this uh, this is what I'm here to do and you know that was kind of part of my message toward the end of the year is you know I don't really I'm not worried about what my area is right now because I'm with you guys and I'm here to talk to you guys and God has me here for this reason more so than on the field like hmm. on the field is going to be what it's going to be but this is where you can impact lives and you can obviously impact lives on the field and whether, you know, it's an interaction with a kid or not. But, um, you know, let's face it, intimate relationships and, and close relationships is one, how our relationship with Christ is supposed to be and how you can really, you know, hopefully impact people is, is, you know, that one-on-one you know, conversation. How about you, Brian, understanding the platform God has provided you? Well, one of the biggest learning experiences is uh, Kyle goes on a lot of mission trails. My wife and I, Went on our first one, I guess, in 2012 uh, to Nicaragua. <laughs> Don't say that word wrong, like by the way. If right? you say Nicaragua, you will get corrected. Nicaragua. So, <laughs> Nicaragua. Nicaragua. But we, we went down there, and uh, so before we got married, we, you know, we were thinking, oh, okay, cool, you know, we're going to have some downtime. We're just going to go and kind of talk to kids and stuff about Christ. Uh, cool, we can do that and stuff. We show up. They're like, ready to work? Like, yeah. Work? Like, work, work? Or like... <laughs> Just like talk to kids, and like, no, put on your shoes. We're going to for a week straight. We're going to build, um, dig trenches mm-hmm. in this um, in this town per se, or just this territory that lives. A fa- each family lives on a, less than a dollar a day. I mean, just dirt poor, and yeah. and we're going to dig them a clean water system. And I was like, okay, so when we get down there, we're going to have breaks to kind of talk to the kids about <laughs> Jesus. Like, no, 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 we're not going to we're not going to talk about anything like that. We're just going to work. And I'm like. Look at my wife. I was like, "Hold on, we signed up to like, you know, come down here and preach the gospel to these people." And their, and their whole mission was about, <clears throat> we do our stuff at our camp, kind of thing. 
rooted in our faith. When you are out there, the Holy Spirit, it's not like I can save anybody. Right. Jesus is the one that works through us when the timing's right. Yeah, yeah we might have a conversation. But when we're down there and called to do that, Jesus works through us in a way that we can't do ourselves. Just let him do the work. And we're just going to be there to work and interact, play soccer with these people, play baseball, let them beam me in the side like they did. But we're going to do that uh, and just kind of see if that. And so many people gave their uh, life to Christ after that. So now, fast forwarding to being a big league baseball player, I'm not going to go out and just have the, have this platform and not try to use it and not try to just play so others can just see Christ living in me. I mean, why not try? Am I going to fail? Absolutely. Am I going to sin? I'm sin every day. But knowing that I've given my life to Christ and he's called me to on this big, huge platform with billions of people always watching you, and I can just live my life and let the Holy Spirit bring others toward him through me, through Kyle, through guys that are followers. He said, he tells us, go out and make disciples, Matthew 28, 19. Go and make disciples. Teach others about Jesus. That's what we're here for. That's what we do. And, um, and just the opportunity to, even today, uh, in the increased conference and, and doing this stuff and just letting other people see Christ living in me and me seeing it. And people I had no idea that were followers that, I'm like, golly, I used to hate this guy. <laughs> now, nah, I mean, you're my, you're my dog, man. You know what I'm saying? And uh, then we get to talk, and, like, it, it's just, it, it's crazy how Christ works, and that's, it's a pretty cool thing. And I, I think that would be my encouragement to everybody listening, is that everybody has a platform. You know, just because we have the ability to talk to more people uh, or have this type of impact because of where we are, you know, we talked about this the other day, like, we're all living on mission, right? Create disciples. You know, whether it's at ESPN or whether it's at, the Minnesota Twins. You are on mission every day, yeah. and um, you know your platform is just different. and And we're all going to be judged on how we use that platform and how we use what we're given. And ultimately, there's a lot of responsibility on us to make sure that we use this platform the right way. Because if we're given all of this and we don't use it for the right purpose, well, then we failed in a sense. And not that it takes away our eternal, you know, gift of, of eternity with heaven, but right. Rewards are, are there, yeah. and we're all going to be given rewards based on what we what we do. It's good stuff. They are Kyle Gibson and Brian Dozier of the Minnesota Twins. It has been a pleasure, guys, to talk to you, hear your story. Hopefully we'll do it again during the season, and just appreciate your uh, your candor and being here on the Sports Spectrum <laughs> Podcast. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it, Jess. Thank yeah, you. My pleasure. And we do appreciate Brian Dozier and Kyle Gibson of the Minnesota Twins joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Make sure you go to our YouTube page as well as our Facebook page. Just search Sports Spectrum. And we're going to have video of this podcast up. You're going to see the video portion of the podcast. And it's pretty neat just to kind of see the room that we were in and and see the guy's expression, not just hear them. So you can check that out at YouTube uh, and at Facebook. If you search our Sports Spectrum pages, we'll be posting the video quality, the video portion, I should say of this podcast there as always you can reach us on twitter at sports underscore spectrum you can reach me on twitter at jason romano and you can email me jason at sports spectrum.com we want to hear your feedback hear what you think of the podcast any guest ideas any thoughts on this interview we just love to hear from you we'd love to hear what you think and who you want to hear on this podcast and as always share this podcast let people know that it's out there Let them know on your Facebook, your Twitter page, your Instagram page, wherever it is. Let them know that you enjoy and you heard this Sports Spectrum podcast. And as always, leave a review on iTunes and let us know what you think. Thank you so much for joining us here, and we will see you next time. It's a Sports Spectrum podcast. Have a good day, everybody.